Perhaps you've stumbled upon this video by chance, and perhaps you're searching for something. Still unknown, yet yearning for adventure. As you desire to unlock the latent potential within the next generation, you also find yourself amidst the journey of your own self-discovery. Regardless, buckle up, because your life is about to change. Welcome to my channel. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name is Kat and I have moved to South Korea four months ago to pursue teaching in South Korea. This has been one of my most requested videos is to do a video on how I became a teacher here, how the process was like for me, how can I become a teacher in South Korea? So today we're going to be spilling all that tea. And honestly, to be honest, I was gonna make the whole video talking about it just like this, but I thought to myself, you know, I'm not a professional and I would much rather you get your valuable questions answered by someone who actually has been in this field for a long time and who can much better answer your questions in more depth and detail than I could ever do. So I actually reached out to my agent who got me here. It will save you so much time. Like there's no way I would have had such smooth of a process if it wasn't for Bradley. Just, I'm just gonna roll the clip and I'll see you after. Hello, Brad. Hello, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, how are you? Doing well, doing well. So quick disclaimer, we actually filmed this all in a coffee shop and it progressively got more noisy as people started going in and the drinks were going off. So, you know, it's a learning experience, but uh, yeah, sorry if there's like a lot of background noise. Um, I'm learning, okay? I just wanna say thank you so much for doing this interview with me and for just doing what you do, honestly, because I wouldn't be here in Korea if it wasn't for you, as well as I think you've placed like all of I my co all of them I've placed. Yeah, it's actually funny because like we all talk about it and we're like, how did you get here? Like, who placed you? And we're all like, Brad, Brad. Like, you know that Spider-Man meme where everybody's like <laughs> pointing, pointing, pointing to each to other? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, just really grateful for that. Um, do you want to like introduce yourself, like what you do, how you started it? And that? Sure, sure. Uh, so my name is Bradley Brennan. Um, I own teachenglishinkorea.org. Uh, I started this officially in 2007, but unofficially in 2006 uh, while I was working for the Korea Tourism Organization. For the last 12 years, I've been a professor uh, at the university or college of business, but I work, uh, you know, full time basically for this business for, for replacing teachers in South Korea. So before we get into it, here are the main basic requirements that you need when teaching abroad. So, you know, they have to meet a minimum of requirements such as being from one of the seven English speaking countries that, you know, a lot of people contact us from India, the Philippines, etc. Um, they can't get an E2 visa. You also have to have a bachelor's degree that's from an English speaking country. Um, and it can't be like, oh, the American University of Cairo. They don't count that as being in a, an English speaking country. And even Canada, if you graduate from a university in Quebec, they won't give you an E2 visa. Mm. Yes. Does the bachelor's degree need to be in education? No, in you? any subject. Uh, because the, Remember, these are just requirements for an E2-1 visa. Mm -hmm. uh, E2-2 is for public school, E2-1 is for private schools. So bachelors in any subject. Um, most schools require a TEFL certificate. Mm -hmm. um, 120 hours is what you need. Uh, there's a lot of good online programs for cheap. You have to get your TEFL if you want to come abroad. Yeah, but TEFL program, as long as you've signed up for it, mm -hmm. it then you can put it on your resume that, you, that you're registered, yeah. but in progress. Then the schools are happy with that. Yeah. You can finish it actually while you're in Korea. Yeah, so you can job hunt while you're doing Yes, your yes, yes. And we, we have a TEFL uh, provider that we've partnered with. Um, it's normally like $250, but it's like $200. We get a 20% discount for our oh. teachers. Oh, yeah, so literally for like 200 bucks, and you could just, I know teachers that finish it in just a couple weeks. Also, you have to have a clean criminal record, uh, whether it's FBI, uh, RCMP, DBS, if you're from uh, the UK. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering, um, out of all all the Asian countries, mm -hmm. why Korea? Like why, what are the perks of coming to oh, Korea versus yep. like any other Asian country? Um, hands down, uh, you can save more money in Korea than any place else. Hmm. Japan and Hong Kong, you could actually, you probably make more monthly salary, but mm -hmm. housing, like for Japan, housing is not included. Mm -hmm. So you spend so much and then the cost of living is so high, so you don't save much money. Um, also, the getting airline ticket included, free housing, uh, usually it's a one-way ticket to Korea or back. Some schools do still do round trip tickets. You get a bonus at the end. Korea's got awesome, um, you know, holistic um, uh, national health care, which is great. 
Uh, so there's lots of different reasons. And also, nowadays, especially the, all of the, uh, the new teachers, everybody's into K-drama, K-pop, the K-culture. Uh, Korea is a hot place to be uh, when it comes to culture-wise. Taiwan is probably the most comparable to Korea, but Korean culture, I, do, I don't want to get hate comments, but, <laughs> Korea, but a lot of the teachers that I've placed that taught in Taiwan that came to Korea, they said hands down it was, it was much better uh, teaching in Korea. Um, just because people, when they come to Korea, it's foreign enough that it's so cool, right? But it's comfortable enough that you're like, it's not too strange. Like, going to mainland China is a huge, huge yeah, culture shock. That's fair. Japan as well. If you're a first time teacher and mm. you're coming to Seoul, like, what are the expectations about placements and, like, what areas are going to be more competitive? Right. So, Seoul is the most competitive place to be. Um, so if you're a first year teacher, you have no experience, you've never taught before, and you're like, nope, soul, 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 then it's gonna be hard to place, right? Um, that's why I say um, it's good to be flexible on location. Uh, Kyunggi-do, like for example, when I first came to Korea, I was in a great city called Bucheon. Bucheon is a million people, and it's only 30 minutes from central Seoul by subway, which costs a buck 50, right? It's super, super cheap. Bucheon's got two different subway lines, it's got a huge city center, massive lake park, a regular park, and it's just literally 30 minutes outside of Seoul. So for me, coming from Tacoma, Washington, 450 to 500,000 people, Bucheon's a million people. Seattle's only a million people. It's not like if you're in, not in Seoul, you're not in the, the yeah. heart of everything. Mm -hmm. um, Daegu is super popular with yeah. expats. Yeah. Daegu, um, it's three and a half million people, and why is Daegu so popular? We place people in Daegu, they don't leave. They either they go home or they stay in Daegu, why? All of the expat bars and restaurants are like in a two block radius in downtown Daegu. Busan, for anybody who likes uh, the, the seaside, beaches. Yeah. And in Seoul, there's so many, Seoul is huge. I mean, you, it takes two hours to get from one end to the other end by public transportation. Mm -hmm. um, but if people really want to uh, get hired in Seoul, I highly suggest to make a self-introduction video, like one minute long. If you go to our website, I'll put, you can put it down at the bottom. Just click on videos. We have over a dozen of our teachers that made really good self-introduction videos. Mm -hmm. Just talking about themselves, bringing the energy, smiling, and that's a really good way to make a positive first impression before you even meet a school. It's funny because I actually don't have an education background. Mm -hmm. uh, I did my degree in accounting, so I was actually really worried about my first interview. Like my first interview, I remember having and being like, okay, it's just gonna be practice. And then I had it and like, it was like on the interview, boom, they're like, yeah, we want you. But would you say like that's the typical um, <laughs> expectation or like what do you think that they can expect to go through like interviews? So for example, um, uh, our team, there's two of us, so we're very different in our approach. So my partner, the way she does it is she's very detailed and thinks exactly what the teacher said, exactly what the school said, and she's like, okay, 1-1, one, one, this is the best school for you. After the interview, I think you should take it because this is, out of all the schools, I think this is the best match. Mm -hmm. Me, I always think of three schools that are good matches, and I want teachers to have three interviews. Mm -hmm. So that way they could compare apples to oranges. It's not the same. One, maybe the, they had a better interview with one, but maybe there's more pay on the other. Maybe there's the locations better on this one. So there's a lot of factors, and I think having a few interviews is good. Um, but you know, if you have a great interview and you think, oh, I really can picture myself working here. I talked to a current teacher. It sounds really good then you don't have to have another interview. Yeah, sure. So what kind of things they should prepare or expect um, the directors to ask? How can they ace their interview? Right. <laughs> yeah. uh, one thing that I think the biggest mistake, uh, I, I, I have actually like a two-page sheet that I made for like interview tips that I always give to teachers before they have an interview. Mm -hmm. But the number one thing is, prepare some questions mm. for the, the director because when they get done and they go, do you, they'll always ask you, do you have any questions? When someone says, no, I don't, then some directors give very thorough one hour long interviews so they basically answer everything. But most directors, if you don't ask them a question, they say, oh, was the teacher really interested? They didn't have any questions. Mm. Do not ask about pay, vacation days, things like that. That shows that you only, you're caring about a certain aspect, right? Mm. Your questions should be about, the students, the curriculum, 
um, you know, showing that you, you care about your job. You know, most people aren't professional teachers, but you should be curious about, well, can you tell me what it's like for a typical, a typical day in a teacher's life at your school? Uh, can you walk me through, like, what are the levels of the students like? What is your curriculum like? This shows that you're very engaged, you're focusing on the job. Preparing questions, and they're always going to ask you, why do you want to teach in Korea? You should think about the children having the teaching job, the international experience, um, you know, being able to travel, um, and the traits they're looking for, positive, outgoing, talkative. Really big one is someone who's able to go with the flow, to be able to laugh at yourself. Those are the people that, that get on really well. And even people who are a lot more intrinsic, um, those people, I've met some of the best teachers that were, that were introverted. And what they did was, because I, 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 I'm a natural extrovert, I talk to anybody, I'll talk to you know, strangers on the street. <laughs> and schools love that, but a lot of my teachers that were awesome teachers, they're introverts, they said, I put on my teacher face, I'm super extroverted in the classroom, and as soon as I get done, I take it off and I go home and I, I recharge for the weekend. <laughs> oh yeah, that's, that's actually me, it's funny because like, <laughs> During the interview, so back at home, it's not like a huge thing, but in Korea, they care about MBTI. Oh, yeah, God, I, I'm a university student. That's the number one question every time I say, okay, get to know each other. They're like, oh, my MBTI is yeah. blah, blah, blah. And then they, oh, we're a good match. We're not a good match. Yeah. yeah, and so I was like actually really surprised that they asked me that in the interview. And I was starting to like sweat. I was like, <laughs> I was like, oh, no. Did like, you remember what yours is? Yeah, I did remember. But they were like, oh, yeah, like, what's your MBTI? thinking that like if I said the wrong MBTI they wouldn't hire me or if like I wasn't an E uh, that wouldn't be a good fit for like teaching but I was just like okay whatever I'm just gonna like be honest and so I was like oh yeah like I'm INCP like I'm an introvert and then they were like oh cool like we're all introverts here <laughs> <It's funny>, like, <laughs> or like my directors were both introverts so they're like yeah yeah like that's cool and I was like phew <laughs> The teaching is hard, mm -hmm. especially the, the average job. 90%, more than 90% of the jobs are kindergarten in the morning, elementary school in the afternoon. And as you know, you don't teach kindergarten, you perform. Oh, yes. And, and no matter how tired you are, no matter how much you had fun at the weekend, yeah. or your butt is dragging, but you have to go and go, hey, everybody, hey, how kids. are you doing? <laughs> how are you? And they're like, oh, you know. They're, <laughs> yeah. they're, I think I get the most questions about this. Um, but like, what is the visa process like? And I yeah. know this topic kind of triggers me because like, the visa was just so hard for well, me. Because like, you, you're Canadian, <laughs> it's much harder for Canadians. Okay, yeah, that's totally fair. And like, I had to fly to Vancouver. Ah, like that's a, that's right. Yeah, I had to fly to a different city twice um, to get visa documents. And that's much of easier for Americans. Okay. Trust me. Good. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not normally like that. Yeah, yeah. Good. No, so for um, well, okay. Canadians, out of the other six countries, Canadian situation's different. The other six countries use apostille. Mm -hmm. So the documents such as your copy of diploma, your, your national criminal record check, mm -hmm. must be apostille notarized. Mm -hmm. um, Canada, in 1966 Hague Agreement, they didn't sign it. So they're not a part of the Hague Agreement. Mm -hmm. That means they don't use the apostille. So Canadian teachers have to get everything authenticated. That means go to a solicitor, a lawyer, get them to notarize it. Then you have to go to a Korean consulate and get them to notarize it. So that's called authentication. authentication. Americans, it's it's piss easy. You basically, I, if you go to our website, I'll, you can put the links below. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, Americans can get an FBI criminal record check uh, done in 12 to 48 hours. Um, for South Africans, it takes months, right? <laughs> to get an apostille, um, if you follow the link on our website, uh, it literally uh, takes, um, they say two to four days, but for our teachers, they do it in one to two days. So Americans can get their FBI background check in one day and get it apostille notarized in one day and back to them in one day. So it takes three or four days. Uh, for Canadians, it's much longer. The RCMP check, it takes about uh, five to ten business days. For uh, British teachers, it takes about five to ten days to get a DBS check. Um, yeah, New Zealand's pretty fast. Uh, same with uh, Australia. But it's a two-step process for everybody. So you have to submit the documents. There's a list. Most important two documents is the National Criminal Record Check. That's either authenticated if you're Canadian or with a postile. The copy of diploma, they don't get your original done because immigration doesn't give it back. Get the copy, a postile notarized or authenticated. The other stuff is easy. 
you know, application, copy of your passport, resume, signed contract, four passport photos. Um, then you send this information to your school. We give a checklist, so it's very easy just to go down the checklist. Uh, also, the link on our website, you can uh, we'll give them that. Yeah. Um, and then uh, they send those documents to the school. The school applies for your visa issuance number, VIN. The VIN takes probably two to three weeks to generate. Once it's generated, they give it to the recruiter, we give it to the teacher with a list of instructions. Mm -hmm. You have to apply at the nearest Korean consulate, whatever jurisdiction you're in. As I remember, uh, Vancouver yeah. was the closest one, but you're not close to Vancouver. Yeah, so there's two in, ca in Canada. It's Vancouver and Toronto, Toronto. So yeah. like, if you're somewhere in the middle of the country, you have to fly to one of those. Um, yeah, so it was a little bit harder, but how long does it usually take for like, um, normally it was taking about four weeks for the visa process, mm -hmm. but um, now, for especially for Canadians and British, it takes about five weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I say five weeks, like let's say for example, today you got a job offer. And you're like, yep, I'd like to take the job. And you have all your documents in hand. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll take you about four or five business days to FedEx your documents to the school. It takes another uh, 10 to 12 business days to get the visa number. And then it takes one to two weeks to finish the visa process at the the Korean consulate. Vancouver's the worst. Uh, <laughs> Seattle's the second worst. Um, but you know, if you look at like Chicago, they take five to seven business days. Or you know, the other Korean consulates, on average, take seven to ten business days. Uh, British, uh, don't get me started. They it, they use KVAC, not the Korean consulate in London. They take uh, about ten business days. Um, but the visa is pretty cheap. The school pays for the visa uh, application in Korea, but teachers pay for the visa process on their side for the visa application fee, which is about forty-five dollars for everybody except Canadian or except uh, British. They have to pay about two hundred euro to finish their um, uh, yeah. visas. <laughs> yeah, I remember. Um, I think getting the FBI check, like the thing, fingerprint check was like 85 Canadian, and then uh, sending documents to South Korea was like 120 Canadian, so it, it all in all is not that good. I'm like so thankful though that like my, uh, my school actually paid for me to fly to the Korean consulate in yeah. Vancouver. Like that was so nice. Yeah, no, your director is really nice, and they—they, yeah. they, I remember they really appreciated because you were like, I gotta go there in person, <laughs> and so it was like a, a, you know, what was it, an hour and a bit flight. Yeah, it was an hour. Flight. It was like a ten-hour drive or something, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, so it was like a round-trip flight, and like I did it, I had to do it twice, and they paid for it twice for me, and so yeah, like, that no. was such a blessing. Like, thank you. But, yeah, yeah. But, but for most, like for Americans. Uh, they can just mail their documents into the yeah. consulates usually mm -hmm. um, you know depending on where you live some mm -hmm. some uh, consulates the, in each one like in our email that we send the visa number mm -hmm. we have all of the consulates listed so you just have to figure out which one is the closest one to you mm -hmm. visit the website just to double check and then mm -hmm. we give all the instructions on how to fill it out mm -hmm. um, but it's it's really it's pretty painless. That's why I said by using a recruiter, we handhold you all the way through. Yes. <laughs> if you do it by yourself, it could cause mass delays, or you can waste a lot of money. Yeah. For um, sure. Planning well ahead and knowing well the process. Mm -hmm. On our website, we have like okay, visa instructions for Americans, for Canadians, for British, and you just click on the link and everything in detail with hot links to all of the different forms. Like for example, oh, if you're American, you need an FBI background check. Well, you have to use a, an approved FBI channeler. Here's a list of FBI approved channelers. And, then, <laughs> and you want to use the live scan fingerprinting because then that way it only takes literally 12 to 24 hours to get your criminal record check. Yeah, for sure. But yeah, plan well in advance for it. Like, I guess if you're from Canada, leave at least like two to three months for the whole visa oh, process. And <clears throat> March 1st and September 1st are the mm. two big hiring dates. Yeah. That's like 80% of all the jobs. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, if you're starting March, first you're gonna come about seven to ten days before that so you'll like leave on a Saturday arrive on a Sunday but between March 1st and September 1st is kind of like shoulder season where it's not high season so that's like you know 20 percent of the jobs and those jobs are mostly a teacher didn't work out so they left um, you know oh there's more students than we thought so we need an extra teacher or some whatever the reason is those are the in-between jobs so but of course schools like it when the teachers 
start at the beginning of the semester, whether it's spring or fall. Mm -hmm. So when do they start posting uh, the job postings? Right. So right now we're interviewing a lot of people for September 1st. Uh, this is now the beginning of March, uh, but we won't have positions for March until or for September until the end of March, beginning of April. Yeah, I, I think it's important to plan well. So if you're thinking you want to start March or September, you know, four or five months before is a good time to start making inquiries, start thinking about documents. Because remember, like the, the criminal checks, they're only good for six months from the date they're issued. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to order it too early, but as long as you apply for the, the visa before the expiration date, the other documents don't expire. Is it easy to extend uh, Yes. Visa? Uh, every school, you know, they prefer to extend you. As long as you do your job and have a good attitude, they're going to want to extend you. Um, you know, some, the times when they don't is usually uh, the teachers not taking their work seriously. Because remember, less about 5% of the teachers have education degrees that are professional teachers. 95% of the teachers, you know, they have a degree in something non-education related. And, you know... It's so funny, I can't believe people say this to me. Like I had a one teacher, he's Korean American, and, and I and I said, Here's the schedule, this is what you have to do. And he goes, Oh, do I have to work hard? And I was like, Are, are you seriously you're gonna ask me that? I, I was like, Yeah, most schedules are nine to six. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, I, you teach a lot of classes, you know, and it, it's not it's not for everybody. Um, but I was a professional educator. I knew that I had to prepare outside of class. Mm -hmm. And some people are like, oh, they make me prepare. And like, well, no shit. You don't know anything. So how, you know, you, the, that, <laughs> that learning curve, the first three or four months, you have to prepare well. Yeah. But after three or four months, it's piss easy because you're teaching the same classes, just cycling through kids. Mm -hmm. So I think that's about the shaping the expectations. Uh, but I think 95% or more, they leave Korea going, I had a great time. Mm -hmm. And it's that 5% that don't, it's always they have a wrong attitude mm -hmm. or they had the wrong uh, expectations of when they came here. Yeah. That's why, like I said, I'm, my main job is helping teachers to sort out their documents, get their document ducks in a row. Mm -hmm. And second thing is shaping expectations of, well, you know, it's not going to be all rainbows and butterflies living in any country. 10%, 20% of our placements are teachers we place their first year that contact us and say, you know, hey, Bradley, I really like this, but I'd like to try a different area or a different city or, you know, I'm, I'm looking for more pay or different hours or whatever it is. Yeah. And then we help them with a, find another school. Uh, the one thing that most teachers don't realize, the impact they have on these kids. And case in point, um, my first year in Korea, I had my regular job and then I, I was teaching a private class um, in the mornings, 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. at a girls' middle school, and I had 54 middle school first-year girls in my class, crazy class, and this was private class, so I was getting extra money. Uh, I, I could tell a whole other thing about private classes, but that's for another time, um, and it, it was great, right? And then, you know, fast forward, you know, I guess it was like seven or eight years later, I was on the subway, and this really pretty girl goes, <gasps> And I was like, oh, hi, how are you? And then I was like, oh, my God. And she was like, Mr. B. And I was like, oh, no. And she's like, Mr. B. And she said, you know, I, I'm a university student. I'm studying English. It's because of you. She said, you know, after I had your class, I wanted to be able to talk to foreigners, and I wanted to speak in English. So I decided that I made English my major. Wow. And it was like, thank you very much. You know, and you, wow. you realize the impact that you have on these kids' lives. I taught at one kindergarten privately for four years, and I had kids from four to five, five to six, six to seven for four years. And all of them spoke with a perfect American accent. And even my British friend who came to visit, he was like, mate, that's a trip. And I said, what? And he goes, they're all mini Americans. Because he <laughs> sat through all my classes. And I, you know, I'm like, hey, what's up? They're like, what's up, B? I was like, show me the money. They're like, show me the money, B. You know, I, I, I would grab phrases out of movies and you know, funny sayings and Aww. just try to make it fun for the kids. Mm -hmm. uh, but you realize that those kids look back and you have have a positive impact on those kids' lives. Yeah. And those kids, they have perfect accents because the main thing that you're doing is you're working on their speaking mm -hmm. and their listening and their pronunciation. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's something they can't learn in a book, mm -hmm. uh, or it's hard to at least. 100%, yeah. Mm. Ask a couple of questions. Um, so for finances, you said that like if you go to Korea, you'll make like a pretty good living and you'll have enough, you'll like save a pretty decent amount. 
Um, what are kind of like the salary expectations right. of like a teacher? Um, right now, um, the good thing is because of the pandemic, uh, the, the the last three years we've seen the salaries go up for the last three years. Uh, so now 2.5, 2.6 is an average starting salary, or 2.5 million, 2.6 million is an average starting salary. Um, before it was 2.2, 2.3, then it was 2.4, 2.5, this year 2.5, 2.6. Um, and there's lots of factors. Seoul, it's the most competitive. They don't have to offer as much money because people want to be in Seoul. Yeah. Kyunggi-do, you're close to Seoul, but it's 30% cheaper for cost of living and they also pay more. The housing is bigger because they spend the same amount of money on your housing, but in Seoul, housing is a lot more expensive, so the places are very small and sometimes older. Um, but it, good rule of thumb, I tell everybody, bring at least $1,000 to last you the first two months, easily be able to get by, um, but you should be able to save at least $1,000 a month. You know, if you're frugal, like when I'm saying frugal, like not going to nightclubs every weekend and just, you know, living a normal life and, you know, enjoying yourself, but, you know, eating a lot of Korean food and not eating Western food, Western food's a lot more expensive, yeah, you could save 1500 so easily a month, mm -hmm. you know. So, and I say a thousand a month, and that's including like going traveling during the breaks and you know really enjoying yourself. Mm -hmm, for sure. um, and also, you get a bonus at the end. So you work 12 months, get paid for 13. Mm -hmm. um, and if you have student loans, I suggest um, putting them in deferment and then pay everything towards your student loans. Uh, yeah. That's what a lot of teachers do. That's what I'm doing right now. Yeah, no, I, I think yeah. that's important. Or for the teachers, I tell everybody, stay two years. Why? If you go home with 25, 30,000 in cash, that's a nice nest egg for buying your first place, mm -hmm. buying a brand new car. I don't suggest it. I said, uh, go home. And it, it's nice that you go home and you're like, you don't have to have a plan when you have $30,000 in the bank when you go home. Yeah. You can take your time and look for a job. You don't, you're not like, God, I got to hit the ground running and have yeah. a job and having income. For sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Brad. No it's problem. Been a pleasure. No problem. It's yeah. been a pleasure. <laughs> okay. So I hope that you enjoyed that little interview. Once again, I have everything we talked about linked down below and Brad will just be in the comments kind of like answering your questions from there too. So feel free to leave a comment and ask more things. And yeah, I really hope Hope that this helps bring clarity to you or helps you understand a little bit more of the process of how you can come to Korea. One last thing, if you are interested in seeing my journey about teaching in South Korea and the things that I get up to, feel free to subscribe and like this video. It helps me out a ton put out more videos like this. So thank you so much for watching and I will see you maybe in Korea. <laughs> Bye, take care, cheers.